Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very latest edition of Derek in the District. I am State Representative uh, Derek Slapp, representing West Hartford, Avon, and Farmington. I'm very glad that you are with us. A um, lot to share with you this month. Uh, our very first guest is Gail Crockett. She's the Democratic Registrar of Voters in West Hartford. We have two Registrar of Voters, and we're going to talk to Gail um, and you know, share the information that you need to know coming up for this election cycle. It's going to be uh, nonpartisan, of course, but uh, just really some very basic information and some of the issues that are going on. Um, so, Gail, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for asking me to join you. Absolutely. And why don't we start off with what does a registrar of voters do? Because I know that's you know that's something that uh, some people might wonder. Yes. Well, um, first and foremost, uh, we are statutorily mandated. Um, under the umbrella of the Secretary of State's office uh, to basically carry out all uh, federal, state, and local election laws. Um, and that includes uh, making sure that uh, citizens who are eligible um, to register to vote are properly registered and that we conduct the elections um, for each uh, election event properly, uh, legally, Mm -hmm. and um, comfortably for our voters because we want voters to um, feel that when they go to a polling location that uh, it's staffed properly with individuals who can assist them and guide them as they make their way through the voting process but also to respect uh, their privacy and confidentiality when they do cast their ballots. Uh, we also uh, make sure uh, for elections that uh, all our locations are handicapped sure. and uh, are uh, accessible for uh, the disabled and, and anyone. And so the registrar's job <laughs> is not a cakewalk. Right. Um, it's a lot more involved uh, than it has been over the years because there are new mandates, uh, particularly uh, through the Secretary of State's office, where all uh, registrars in each of our 169 towns mm -hmm. um, are required to take um, a series of uh, certification courses which you have to pass each individually so that you are eligible to sit for the state certification exam right. and once you pass that uh, you are basically a certified registrar in the state of Connecticut. So how do you become a registrar? I think what you were telling <laughs> us is how you stay a registrar, how you yes. become eligible, but how do you actually become a registrar? Well, how you become eligible is, is a two-pronged process. Yep. Um, you are um, nominated by your respective party's town committee, and uh, you receive the endorsement, and then your name is placed on the ballot in your locality. And the citizens vote you in. So while it's the political town committee right. that nominates and subsequently endorses you for the ballot, yep. it's the citizens who vote yay or nay. Right. So I am an elected official. And you have a Republican counterpart. Absolutely. And, and why don't you share, share her name? Uh, uh, more, her so name is know. Beth Kyle. Okay. And um, each of the 169 towns has one Democrat and one Republican uh, registrar and depending on the size of your office and it, the budget that's afforded to you yep. by your town, um, the staffing can be different. In our case in West Harvard, we have a Republican and Democratic registrar and we each have deputies. Right. And I imagine you work together probably very well and closely, right? Well, it's very much necessary. Yeah. Um, and it's like a marriage, you know, there <laughs> okay. is ups and downs. Sure. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the only focus or the main focus is that uh, we do our job, uh, we adhere to the rules and regulations, yep. um, and uh, we make sure that um, we all are on the same page. Right, and that's you know serving the public Absolutely. In, a, in a fair, open, and transparent way. Absolutely. Right? So why don't you share some information with us all in right. terms of, we were talking earlier about yes. some interesting statistics yes. and what's mm -hmm. happening in West Hartford in terms of voter registration. A lot of interest, I think, in the Democratic, small d, right, in the Democratic process, yes. which is good, which is right. healthy, right? So the town of West Hartford is very special because we have approximately 62, 63,000 residents. And as of um, April, uh, when we ran our monthly reports, mm -hmm. we show that we have 47,710 uh, registered voters in town, which is 
significant. It's huge. Um, so that speaks to the level of interest um, and um, desire on the part of our citizens right. to be a part of this very important uh, process of voting. Um, there are, as of April, 21,948 Democrats okay. and uh, 7,909 Republicans and 17,204 unaffiliated voters. There you go. So, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are some, uh, and I guess, you know, I was going to ask you what are some important dates related to primaries, mm -hmm. right? Because we know there's, on both sides, there's some primaries coming up. Right. Um, if you are um, unaffiliated, yes. you cannot vote in the primary, correct? You can vote in the primary, which we anticipate will, there will be one in our town and yep. in many towns. Uh, that date is August 14th. Okay. And if you are unaffiliated voter, you actually have... Uh, until noon on August 13th okay. to change your party. However, if you are a Democrat or Republican or a Republican who wants to change to a Democrat, you have to change your party affiliation by May 14th. And so we have posted on our website yep. all of those very important critical dates. We also have it posted on the registrar's door in Town Hall, which is room 209, and on our bulletin board. And um, so it's a very important um, piece of information for people to have. Yeah, absolutely. So, I also would like to just note that if you are a young person who's going to be turning 18 right. by the November 6th election, you are eligible to vote in the primary. So uh, right. for the young folks out there yeah. who have gotten become very engaged in right. uh, policy making, decision making, and who our leaders are and want to have a say, and they want to exercise mm -hmm. their right to vote and um, the power that comes along with that, my uh, suggestion is is that you make sure you're registered and you vote. Right, and that's something that may surprise people that you can actually vote when you're 17, right? Just well, as, as long, long as, as you can vote, right, as long as you're going to be 18 by the general election, exactly. You can vote in the right. primary. Right, and so also I'd like to say to the young folks because we look like we're having a primary in August. Right. Um, some of you may be home. Um, and may be interested in seeing about working at the polls. So we do have a uh, limited opportunity okay. uh, for young people to possibly become poll workers. Um, and uh, the application is also on the Registrar Voters um, website um, under the town of West Hartford. And we also have them in our office. And um, I and Beth are more than happy to receive uh, poll worker applications um, from young people and anyone in general who's interested. Okay, and uh, what's the shift like? Is it Does it start uh, at six in the morning and go till eight at well, night? Is it the, one long the shift? All, the all day shift is 5.15 to 9.15. Uh, even though the polls close at eight, there's okay. always wrap up and sure. what have you at the poll location. So we That's tell- 5.15 a.m. 5.15 a.m. To 9.15. PM, yeah. right. Yes. Okay. Now, there is an opportunity in some of the poll worker uh, positions, such as a checker mm -hmm. um, and the ballot clerk, uh, to work a half-day shift. So uh -huh. you could possibly work 515 to 115, and then 115 to 915, as long as we can fill the shift that's left open right. uh, because we have to have a full complement of workers but that's that's become appealing to folks sure. there are early morning risers sure. and there are folks who are not and there are people who don't mind working late right. and then there are those who just have incredible stamina it's good that you have that flexibility uh, i yeah. was a candidate last last election and um i, I gotta give credit my daughters came out and we started poll standing just before 6 a.m uh -huh. right? and didn't stop of course until the polls closed so they stood yes. out there you know that that whole time but that's that's tough yeah. to do and, yeah but they're not going to be standing you, you'll be inside no, the, we were out in the, cold, the poll so. workers are inside but it's still yeah. a very long, a long day shift. because yeah. it's serious business in the polling yeah. locations and um, poll workers take their jobs, um, you know, very seriously, and they understand that proper conduct 
is essential sure and they need to pay attention and make sure that people are properly and correctly checked off that ballots are fed into the tabulator machine properly and if there's a problem you know we have to address that so it's a long day yes. but I think it's very much worthwhile it's exciting it. too and you do I mean, get paid you, and you get paid and then. you get paid All right. So uh, we have a couple minutes left. What are some issues that you're facing or your office is facing kind of coming down the pike? And there's, I know there's some state legislative uh, stuff too. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that if you want in terms of there's an effort to have, um, for any reason, people can vote early. So that's one thing that's mm -hmm. kind of floating out there that the legislature would have to act on. But there's some other issues I know that you're, that you're looking at. Um, well, in our office um, per se, I think I've covered the issues okay. that, that you know, we're looking at. Um, you know, right now we are in the process of uh, finishing up our annual canvas. Uh, all registrars are required every year to uh, basically conduct a canvas of the citizens to find out who's still in town, who's not. And that is specifically for the po purpose of making sure that we have accurate records in mm -hmm. our office mm -hmm. so we know, um, you know, who's an eligible legitimate voter or not. So we want to know if you're still in town or not, if you've moved. Right. And many folks listening will probably say, oh yes, I know someone who received that notice. Please send it back to us. It's very important. Um, and it's, it's one of our ways of making sure that the, the voter registration records are as up-to-date current as possible. We count on our citizens to help us out with that. Um, with regard to some of the issues that are very hot topics right now um, mm -hmm. in the news media with respect to hacking, yeah. um, we have not had any experience in the town of West Hartford or as far as I understand from the Secretary of State, Denise Merrill, um, in the state. I do know that on the uh, state level through her office, uh, they are looking into making sure that there is no hacking right. occurring. Right. So we're pretty confident that our registration system um, has so far been able to withstand any intrusion. Good. So that's that's you, more of a state level yes. trickling down to yes. us as registrars. Why don't you tell folks, because we're, we're essentially running out of time here, but I want to make sure that if folks want to contact you, that they mm -hmm. know how to do that. So what's, sure. your, what's good contact information for you? Uh, so good contact information is, uh, I'll give you my email. It's uh, gail, G-A-I-L dot Crockett, C-R-O-C-K-E-T-T, at West Hartford, C-T, that's one word, dot sure. gov. So it's gail.crockett at westhartfordct.gov. My direct phone line is 860-561-7456. Uh, feel free to leave me a message uh, because we're not open every day. Okay. But uh, my messages are transcribed into my emails. And I do re uh, retrieve them from remote. So if you call me, email me. I'll right. get your message. All right, and you'll get back to whoever it is. Absolutely, I'm sure, I'm sure you will. absolutely. So, Gail, yes. thank you so much for thank your service you. to our town, for thank helping you. our democratic process work smoothly, and you know, working in such a bipartisan and professional yes, manner. Yes, thank you really very much. Important. Yes. So, thank uh, you so much. Of course. All right. Well, hopefully, you got some great information. We are going to take a quick break. We're uh, back with a very important topic: net neutrality. What is it, and why you should care about it? We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to a segment I call Slap Salutes. And um, this uh, segment, we're going to uh, highlight the efforts uh, by the ACLU and by many consumer groups uh, and many folks, including myself in the legislature, um, to fight for what we call net neutrality. And uh, many of you may have heard of that term, but not know exactly what it means and uh, what really is at stake. So uh, joining me now to talk about that is uh, Kaylee Lentini. Kaylee is, I want to make sure I get the title right, Legislative Counsel for the ACLU of Connecticut. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So why don't we start with the basics? What is net neutrality? Network neutrality is about the basic principle that 
big internet companies shouldn't be able to decide what we can and can't see online. With network neutrality, big internet corporations can't slow down our connections, they can't block us from seeing lawful content, and they can't create fast lanes for companies that pay them more money. Right. Without network neutrality, though, activists could lose an important platform to call for change, businesses can lose the opportunity to compete and grow, and educators and healthcare professionals can lose a critical platform to inform their students and their patients. Without network neutrality, right. people may not be able to get the information that they need, which can harm our democracy. People look at news sites online and also go to Twitter to figure out what our elected officials are doing. Right. They're debating policy and politicians on Facebook, and they're also looking at candidates' websites to determine who they're going to vote for. So what happens if a candidate gives a good chunk of money to an internet corporation? Does that mean that we then don't get to see the other candidates' websites? That's something that could happen without network neutrality. Right. So yeah. the internet has really become the lifeblood of our democracy, and network neutrality is about fairness and about people's ability to participate in that democracy. Well said. I hope that's that's clear. It really is, um, if you think about it, the internet's like the town town square, right? Absolutely. And it's where we do commerce. It's where we communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that it should be um, open, right, mm -hmm. and transparent and accessible to, to everybody, right? right? So I guess um, the way I look at it, too, is that that the ISPs, which is kind of the, um, the acronym for the internet service providers, mm -hmm. right, should treat all content the same in terms of, you know, you could say, that, you know, we're going to, you could buy a faster package, right, more data, you can do that, but we can't say certain content within that data we're going to treat differently than other content. Is that a fair kind of way to describe it? Absolutely. Network neutrality means that the internet service providers can't discriminate against content. So that means that everyone will have equal access to information, which is really important for our democracy. Right. So here's here's what, so I'm a, a vice chair of the Energy Committee, and we've been, Energy, I should say, and Technology Committee, because that technology part is why we have uh, been debating a net neutrality bill, Senate Bill 2, introduced by the Majority Leader Bob Duff, who's who's been pushing it and doing it and doing a great job. And that bill actually died in committee just about a week or so ago. When people are watching this, it'll be maybe a month or so ago. But um, nonetheless, so we got to we got to keep up the fight, and there's some ways that we could do that. Um, it died in committee. Unfortunately, it was a, it was a partisan um, issue here. In other states, it's not. Um, but if you could, my, I guess my question is, why are all of a sudden? people hearing a lot about this now. I mean, it's it's something related to what happened with the Trump administration at the federal level, correct? Absolutely. So what happened is that in December of 2017, the Federal Communications Commission voted to repeal these network neutrality rules, which were put in place back in 2015. And so as people are starting to understand the concept of net neutrality and how it really affects them in their everyday lives, and particularly in our democracy and their right. participation in it, states and around the country, people are working together to try to preserve that network neutrality. Right, and there are some folks who say, well, you know what, we don't need um, new uh, net neutrality rules because prior to 2015, there were no rules. And that's actually not true, right? I mean, that, that there were rules, I believe, from 2010 to 2014, and then they were thrown out in this Verizon court decision. So I found that really fascinating. I actually read the part of the decision and and what was going on at that time. And they said that these ISPs have both the incentive and the ability to, um, you know, to, uh, to block, to throttle, mm -hmm. right, and to have this paid prioritization. So that's why the 2015 decision came out. So the, I, I look at it, I'd love to get your, your take on this, that we've never had the current business model with the ISPs, meaning it's about data, right? It's about, it's not, I think that changed in 2009 when ISP started making more money from uh, data than voice, let's say. So their business model changed um, and we've never had this time where there's no rules at all. Right, and because the business model has changed, there's actually more incentive now for them to do these things that would be against these net neutrality rules. And unfortunately, we don't have to guess at what will happen without network neutrality rules. Though there were some before, long before the FCC voted to implement the net neutrality rules in 2015, we saw internet service providers committing abuses. We saw AT&T actually turn off the sound on a concert that it was streaming online because one of the band members 
criticized George Bush. We saw Comcast slowing down video mm -hmm. sharing online because it was rumored that they actually wanted to be selling videos online. And then we saw Verizon even turn off access to a text messaging system for NARAL Pro-Choice America, a reproductive rights organization, mm -hmm. because they didn't like the message that they were sending out to their members. So unfortunately, this is something that we know what can happen. And now, as you said, because the business model has changed a little bit, there's actually even more room for abuses, which is why it's so important that we work to protect net neutrality now. Right, and I, and I would argue actually the business model has been completely changed. I mean, if you look at the number of, uh, just, just think of yourself, if you're watching this, like, you know, your relationship with your cell phone and how you used it, and if you had one 10 years ago, maybe it was a flip phone and you used it just for texting and if that, right? And talking on the phone, and now, what do you do on your phone and the data, right? And we, I mean, we live on the internet constantly. So uh, I think it's, it's not a partisan issue. And in 30 states across the country, um, with the exception of ours, really, it hasn't been. Um, you know, so one issue that I'd um, love for, for you to address too, and this came up in the committee, is mm -hmm. some members uh, and my friends and colleagues on the other side of the aisle said, um, we believe in, in net neutrality, but we think it's a federal issue. And I think we can have reasonable debates about is there a role for states to play and how should the state play that? Right? right. I know one of the arguments that's been made is an argument about preemption, basically saying that the federal government has sort of filled this regulatory space and that states can't take on this issue. Right. And there are legal experts on both sides of the preemption issue, but we at the ACLU of Connecticut don't believe that there's any reasonable reading of the Federal Communications Commission's uh, preemption argument that wouldn't allow states to take some action. And with, like you said, about 30 states introducing legislation to preserve net neutrality, over 20 attorneys general, including our own, signing on to a suit against the FCC, and five governors signing executive orders to preserve net neutrality, we're not the only ones who are thinking that way. Right, and there are so a number of things that the states could do. There was one bill, and unfortunately it did not make it out of um, one of another legislative committee, uh, and that would require <coughs> that if an ISP was doing business with the state of Connecticut, mm -hmm. right, so the actual state government itself, mm -hmm. that it had to adhere to net neutrality principles, right? Yes. So that bill did not make it out. Um, potentially, our governor could sign an executive order like um, the ones that other states have done, right? That's true, and the ACLU of Connecticut would welcome the continuation of the conversation around network neutrality in the state. Good, okay, so that's one option. Um, you know, the other option, this was Senate Bill 2, mm -hmm. uh, and as we mentioned, that bill um, did not make it out of the Energy Committee. Um, that would require that if uh, an ISP did business in the state, not with, but just in the state generally, that it would have to adhere to these principles. Um, so there's a lot of different ideas, actions out there. I, you know, I wonder from your research, um, what's been the strategy of most of these other states? Has it been the if you do business with the state or it's or if you do business in the state? That's a good question. I'm not sure I know about all of the different yeah. legislative approaches, but I know the ones that have passed, at least in Washington and Oregon, have been more about just in general internet service providers right. in the state that are actually operating in the state. And like you said, one of our bills that was a little bit broader was prohibiting internet service providers that operate in the state from doing those things from blocking, from stopping people from looking at lawful content, from throttling, slowing down, and then also the paid prioritization, making those fast lanes for people that um, people and companies that pay them more money. So I think really both of those models are good models for states to do. Right. But obviously, if we are regulating internet service providers, these internet companies that are operating in the state, and not just the ones that are contracting with the state, then we are preserving net neutrality in a bigger way, and I think that's a great way to go. Right, and you know, and we're remaining competitive too. If you think about it, I mean, Absolutely. we could potentially be, I mean, I guess one avenue is that there's 30, 35 states that uh, pass and have net neutrality, and we're one of a handful that don't. Mm -hmm. That is scary, I would say. I mean, having listened yes. to small businesses come in and testify at the mm -hmm. public hearing in the Energy Committee, and they say, you know what, for innovation and for us being able to get to market, we need to have an open internet, right? Um, so that's one possibility. I guess the other is that states passing laws put pressure on Congress to pass, right, or re really repeal 
the repeal of net neutrality. I know that's kind of confusing. But. No, that's that's exactly right. There is federal action that could take place as well, and we do also have this suit against FCC. But the Congress Congress could actually take action on this, and um, we would welcome federal action as well. The ACLU of Connecticut is part of a broader network of ACLU affiliates, and I know that all of our affiliates and our national organization as a whole is putting pressure at the federal level to make sure that Congress is taking this as a serious right. issue because it really is, and it affects everyone. Yeah, and I, I hate to be a skeptic, um, but when it comes to congressional action, you know, Congress does not have, as we know nationally, the same type of clean elections mm -hmm. um, program that we do. And my fear is that the special interests when it comes to uh, Washington will have a big influence mm -hmm. in terms of blocking right, legislation that would set, you know, in place some net neutrality. But I mean, we see this with a lot of different legislation. Um, so, you know, that's why I think it's so important the work that the ACLU does and other organizations, but you have a tough task because you're going up against some very moneyed special interests who do not want to see rules of the road established, I would say. Right, and unfortunately here in Connecticut, this became a, a partisan issue, and a few legislators chose the big, the wishes of big internet over the interests of everyday people. We're not sure why that happened. As you said, this was passed largely um, on a bipartisan vote in other states and in um, Washington. And so I think you're right that there, you know, there are these big interests out there, these big lobbyists, and that's why it's so important for everyone who uses the internet that's impacted. Everyone will be impacted by net neutrality. It's important for everyone to stand up and let their legislators right. know that they are concerned about the fact that, that this conversation in Connecticut ended so abruptly and that they would like the conversation to continue. Right. I mean, this is, um, and I know you agree, worth fighting for, right? And, Absolutely. And will there be lawsuits? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if we're not fighting for an open and fair internet, you know, right? What are we saying to our small businesses and to our consumers? And I do think, and I, I'm sure you probably looked at some polling and, and some, you know, general information about what the public thinks. Um, I haven't, this is an area where the public is, I mean, it is clear they want net neutrality, right? As much 70 to 90%, doesn't matter what party affiliation, they want net neutrality. Right, I think people understand that this is such an important issue. You know, we need to make sure that everyone has equal access to information in order for them to participate in our democracy. People are sharing their opinions online. They're lifting their own voices up and other people's voices up online. They're debating online. They're looking at what our elected officials are doing, sharing knowledge, learning mm -hmm. from one another, and organizing around really important issues online. If not, if everyone cannot have, see the same content online or can't do the same things online, then the system really isn't fair. And that's how net neutrality is really about fairness and about the ability of everyone to participate in our democracy in a meaningful way. Well said. Thank so you. Thank you very much for, for your time. Kaylee Lentini with the ACLU of Connecticut. And we're going to keep up the fight. We're going to work with the ACLU and uh, hopefully many of you as well. Um, and we're going to continue to put pressure and fight for our small businesses and consumers. So we are out of time for this uh, edition of Derek in the District. I want to uh, give you my contact information. It's Derek, D-E-R-E-K dot slap, S-L-A-P, at C-G-A dot C-T dot gov. You can find me on Facebook as well. I am the only slap or Around, so I'm very easy to find. Uh, thanks again for spending uh, half an hour uh, with me and I will see you uh, very soon. So long.